You know, I, I remember uh, the moment very well. Uh, four summers ago, picking up the New York Times and starting to read on the front page a story that, that blew me away. Uh, perhaps some of you had that experience as well. It was a story about a notorious Scoflaw ship, the Dona Liberta, a rusty refrigerator ship that was uh, presented uh, in this article as a sort of case study of appalling uh, misconduct at sea. The ship routinely abused, cheated, and abandoned its crew, committed serious environmental violations, engaged in illegal fishing, and left a number of debts unpaid. The article shone a light on a vast, menacing world rarely covered, an offshore frontier crucial to the existence of our planet, and yet one in which impunity is the norm in the face of murder, piracy, slavery, commercial crimes, environmental crimes, you name it. A series of articles followed that first one in July 2015, document documenting the egregious crimes being committed on the high seas and largely going unpunished. Subsequent pieces reported on killings of stowaways and, and others, sea slavery, intentional dumping, illegal fishing, gun running, and the stealing of ships. But there was more to expose, so much more, in fact, that the author of the series, uh, Ian Urbina, went on to write a book, The Outlaw o Ocean, uh, which is being released this week. It's not even officially out yet. you got to wait a couple more days, so you guys are really lucky to be, to be getting your copies. <laughs> and we're delighted that Ian is here with us this afternoon to talk about uh, his uh, phenomenal uh, chronicle. As Ian recounts in the introduction, he's long been enchanted by the sea, but it wasn't until one winter in, during a very cold uh, uh, time in Chicago uh, when he was five years into the do uh, doctor's, uh, doctoral program in history and anthropology uh, that he decided to act on his fascination with the sea. Taking a break, he went to Singapore for a stint as a deckhand and resident anthropologist on a marine research ship. And there for several months, he got to know a number of uh, merchant seafarers and long-haul fishermen. He never finished his dissertation at the University of Chicago. Instead, in 2003, he went to work at the New York Times, initially on the Metro desk, then moved to the National desk, and eventually became an investigative reporter. Occasionally, and without success for a while, uh, he pitched to his editors the idea of doing a series about the offshore world, making the case that it's an expansive, lawless realm receiving very little media attention. Finally, in 2014, he was given the green light, and the Outlaw Ocean series was born, with Ian uh, reporting firsthand in Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Middle East, uh, much of that time spent on fishing ships. In early 2017, to enlarge the series into a book, he took a leave from the Times that lasted more than a year. The results a, a truly stunning and riveting expose that bears witness to a world rarely seen by the rest of us, a woefully unprotected world of mayhem, criminality, exploitation, and misery, but also a world that's vital to the global economy. And if you're sitting there thinking all this would make a great movie as well, you're not alone. Leonardo DiCaprio, Netflix, and Misher Films have acquired the movie rights. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ian Urbina. Thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you for Politics and Prayers for hosting me. Um, so I've never done this before at least not for a book of this sort. Um, so uh, I'm going to wing it. Um, I think I'm going to start with a short reading uh, from the introduction. It seems odd to be talking to you about a book that none of you have read, but um, uh, maybe uh, you'll buy a copy. And But I'm going to rush through and uh, not read a whole lot um, so that we can hurry up and get to Q&A, because um, I think that's when the more interesting part will come out. So this is from the introduction of the book, uh, and in some ways uh, just sort of sets the stage uh, for uh, why I started out on the project and um, what 
my goals were at the outset. About 100 miles off the coast of Thailand, three dozen Cambodian boys and men worked barefoot all day and into the night on the deck of a Persiner fishing ship. Fifteen-foot swells climbed the sides of the ship, clipping the crew below the knees. Ocean spray and fish innards made the floor skating rink slippery. Seesawing erratically from rough seas and gale winds, the deck was an obstacle course of jagged tackle, spinning winches, and tall stacks of 500-pound nets. Rain or shine, shifts ran 18 to 20 hours. At night, the crew cast their nets when the small silver fish they target, mostly jack mackerel and herring, were more reflective and easier to spot in darker waters. During the day, when the sun was high, temperatures topped 100 degrees Fahrenheit, but they worked nonstop. Drinking water was tightly rationed. Most countertops were crawling with roaches. The toilet was a removable wooden floorboard on the deck. At night, vermin cleaned the boys' unwashed plates. The ship's mangy dog barely lifted her head when the rats, which roamed on board like carefree city squirrels, ate from her bowl. If they were not fishing, the crew sorted their catch and fixed their nets, which were prone to ripping. One boy, his shirt smudged with fish guts, proudly showed off his two missing fingers, severed by a net that had coiled around a spinning crank. Their hands, which virtually never fully dried, had open wounds, slit from fish scales, and torn from the net's friction. The boys stitched clothes the deeper cuts themselves. Infections were constant. Captains never lacked for amphetamines to help the crews work longer, but they rarely stocked antibiotics for infected wounds. On boats like these, deckhands were often beaten for small transgressions like fixing a torn net too slowly or mistakenly placing a mackerel in a bucket for sablefish or herring. Disobedience on these ships was less a misdemeanor than a capital offense. In 2009, the UN conducted a survey of about 50 Cambodian men and boys sold to Thai fishing boats. Of those interviewed the UN by the UN personnel, 29 said they witnessed their captain or other officers kill a worker. The boys and men who typically worked on these ships were invisible to the authorities because most were undocumented immigrants. Dispatched into the unknown, they were beyond where society could help them, usually on so-called ghost ships, unregistered vessels that the Thai government had no ability to track. They usually did not speak the language of their Thai captains, did not know how to swim, and being from inland villages, had never seen the sea before this encounter with it. Virtually all of the crew had a debt to clear, part of their indentured servitude, a travel now, pay later labor system that requires working to pay off money they had to borrow to sneak illegally into a new country. One of the Cambodians, Cambodian boys approached me and deeper into our conversation, he tried to explain in broken English how elusive this debt became once they left land. Pointing to his own shadow and moving around as if he were trying to grab it, he said, can't catch. This was a brutal place, one that I spent five weeks in the winter of 2014 trying to visit. Fishing boats on the South China Sea, especially in the Thai fleet, had for years been notorious for using so-called sea slaves, mostly migrants forced offshore by debt or duress. The worst among these ships were the long haulers, many of which fish hundreds of miles from shore, staying at sea sometimes for over a year, as mother ships provided supplies and shuttled their catch back to shore. No captain had been willing to carry me and a photographer the full distance, more than 100 miles, out to these long haul boats. So we instead hopscotched from boat to boat, 40 miles on one, 40 on the next, and so on, to get out far enough. As I watched the Cambodians, who, like some waterbound chain gang, chanted to ensure synchronicity in pulling their nets, I was reminded of an incongruity that confronted me time and again over several years of reporting offshore. For all its breathtaking beauty, the ocean is also a dystopian place, home to dark inhumanities. The rule of law, 
often so solid on land, bolstered and clarified by centuries of careful wordsmithing, hard-fought jurisdictional lines, and robust enforcement regimes, is fluid at sea, if it's to be found at all. There were other contradictions. At a time when we know exponentially more about the world around us, with so much at our fingertips and but a swipe or a tap away, we know shockingly little about the sea. Fully half of the world's people now live within 100 miles of the ocean, and merchant ships haul about 90% of the world's goods. Over 56 million people globally work at sea on fishing boats, and another 1.6 million on freighters, tankers, and other types of merchant vessels. And yet journalism about this realm is a rarity, save for the occasional story about Somali pirates or massive oil spills. For most of us, the sea is simply a place we fly over, a broad canvas of darker and lighter blues. Though it can seem vast and all-powerful, it is vulnerable and fragile in part because environmental threats travel far, transcending the arbitrary borders that map makers have applied to the oceans over the centuries. Like a dissonant chorus in the background, these paradoxes captivated me throughout my journeys. Jumping to the end. In the end, the goal of this project is to bear witness to a world rarely seen. It recounts a maritime repo man spiriting a tanker from a Greek port into international waters, and a doctor clandestinely shuttling pregnant women from Mexican shores to the high seas to administer otherwise illegal abortions. It chronicles the work of vigilante conservationists who, in the South Atlantic Ocean, chased Interpol's most wanted poacher ship, and then in the Antarctic, hunted and harassed Japan's last factory whaling ship. In the South China Sea, I landed in the middle of an armed standoff between two countries, each of which had taken hostages from the other. Off the coast of Somalia, I found myself temporarily stranded on a small wooden fishing boat in pirate-infested waters. I saw a ship sink, rode out violent storms, and watched a near mutiny. Reporting these stories took me from a submarine in the Antarctic and South Atlantic Oceans to offshore weapons depots in the Gulf of Oman and to oil platforms in the Arctic and the Celebes Sea. For all that adventure, though, the most important thing I saw from ships all around the world and I've tried in this book to capture was an ocean woefully underprotected and the mayhem and misery often faced by those who work these waters. So that kind of sums up the sort of corners of the canvas of the book. Um, And as was mentioned, this journey, if you will, started in 2014 uh, as a agenda I had for many years at the Times, which was to find a way to get the gray lady to pay to send me back to sea. (laughs) And um, I had failed so many times before in pitching the idea to editors. Usually, I think, it was never even as much as a conversation. It was just sort of a quizzical, skeptical, what are you talking about look when I would pitch the idea because it's too expensive. It takes too much time. It can be dangerous. Um, And you're just out of the paper for too long. Um, It's an unusually slow subject to try to write about for obvious reasons. Um, But then I met Rebecca Corbett. She was my editor, this uh, somewhat famous editor. Used to be at the Baltimore Sun and then was at the Times. Um, And she had previously edited a Pulitzer Prize winning project about ports um, connected to actually the fifth series of The Wire um, uh, when she was at the Baltimore Sun. So she knew a fair amount about shipping and the maritime world. And uh, for that reason, I think she heard me out. And um, I told her I'd worked a bit in this space and I knew it was um, an epic frontier with um, a real diversity of colorful characters uh, one that I think most land lovers had no awareness of, and um, wouldn't that be an amazing thing to bring these stories to our readers? And she, as I, you know, left the office, and she said, "Yeah, why don't you write me up a memo?" Which was further than I had ever gotten. She said, um, "But before you go," and she had already, you know, picked up the phone, was calling someone else, and she said, "Wait one second. And I stopped the door, and she said. Um, 
yeah, so I think it sounds like an interesting idea, but no fish. And I remember thinking, um, and, and I see a lot of familiar faces here, and I'm sorry if you've heard this story like five times over. Um, uh, I remember thinking, wait, so we're going to do an ocean series, but no fish. All right, this is um, a formula for failure. Um, but her point was, and I think it's one of the most important things, as I set out, was that this is a space, it's a frontier that um, uh, journalistically might be better chronicled um, if the initial focus, the primary focus, is on the people out there. And then, um, obviously, the environmental concerns, the crimes against the place and the creatures below the waterline will enter the picture quite robustly. But, um, And as a somewhat former anthropologist, that really enticed me. So I was more than willing to focus on the people more than the fish. But that's how it all began. And, and with time, the sort of ambitions of the project also grew and picked up one ambition quite strongly, which was um, there is, whenever I would say to people early on, I'm working on some stuff about maritime crime, because that was the elevator short version of what I was doing, they'd say, oh yeah, so Somali piracy. And I'd kind of have this, yeah, but kind of thought in my head. Um, because, as I said, I think mo most people, when they think about anything bad happening at sea, it's either the perfect storm, you know, weather, uh, spills, or Somali piracy, largely because of Hollywood, frankly, if you think of it. Um, and so I thought, well, there's so much more happening out there. Not all bad, you know, a lot of her heroism as well, but just wild stuff, um, uh, fascinating stuff, um, a, a frontier prone to bizarre characters. Um, there's a piece that just came out this week in The Atlantic, which is a excerpt, it's a chapter in the book about sea land, which is, you know, ostensibly the smallest micronation on the planet. And it's really just a converted gunnery platform from World War II that these guys took over, this family, the Bates family took over. And at that moment, it was in international waters. And they said, look, we can, the war's over, we can take over this, and the Brits are going to have no ability to say otherwise. And thus began the epic story of the nation or the principality of Sealand. Um, perfect example of just strange, um, colorful characters you meet out there that are neither good nor bad, but are just darn interesting. Um, so, like I said, one of the goals was to sort of diversify and expand the spectrum of understanding about what happens out there and who is out there and, and, um, and quite often, what are the crimes, the human rights and labor abuses that are occurring out there? Um, so uh, that was on the, on the front end. About By the time I got to the book, so the series ran as eight pieces in The Times over the course of a year and a half. Then I took a leave from The Times, went back out to see um, for two years to report more. And um, somewhere in there, I became captivated by this sort of background story, which was um, almost the psychology of the people, not just the psychology of the people and why they want to, why people are drawn to the space, why people take these jobs, um, but also what happens to you when you spend a lot of time in this space. Um, and that is a, understated theme in the book that sort of I try to manifest at the end without bludgeoning you, but um, it was this nagging deeper question I had, you know, how do these people who sometimes are withstanding pretty horrific ongoing situations survive um, and with their faculties intact if they do? Um, and um, what was interesting in the end was that the very same thing, I don't know if I'll be, I hadn't thought that I was going to try to make this triple axle on the, on the ice here, but at the end of the book, um, so I'm going to, um, there, there was this grand epiphany at the end of the book for me personally, which, which brought together, spoiler alert, the different things I had found out there. One was part of the reason the outlaw ocean is outlaw is because it's, so huge. And it's that's just at the core of it. It's out of sight, out of mind. The public doesn't really know what happens out there, doesn't much care. 
It's just too big to police. A lot of it doesn't belong to anyone in particular. There are lots of reasons, but just at the end of the day, it's just the geography. It's a huge space that is absent key things, rules and enforcement. At the same time, on the ships and the experience of interacting with this diaspora transient tribe of seafarers, I constantly was noticing um, silence and the lack of conversation and just the quiet, almost oppressive quiet that would unfold in these trips. Sometimes three days without a word, sitting on the bridge with a bunch of guys. It's just like marvelous and awful to behold, you know. And I was perplexed by that. So you have this huge open space and you have this unusual silence. Um, and then you have this real lack of governance. And in the end, I realized to some degree, all of those things are part of the same, which is essentially a void. You know, uh, um, the lack of conversation is the lack of interaction, the sort of solitary confinement that these people experience um, is similar to the lack of governance and the sprawling and beautiful and oppressive um, openness of the space um, uh, sort of all comes together as sort of a deep sense for it's not really good or bad, the outlaw ocean, it's just a void. Um, so at that ridiculously high altitude, um, uh, I'd love to open it up for a Q&A. I was encouraged to ask people to come up to the mics if they have questions. And since there are a lot of familiar faces here, I really expect <laughs> you guys to ask some questions. <laughs> Family. <laughs> Ian, can I yeah. just start it off? Uh, sure. Because uh, in case anybody's wondering, maybe you, you, you could tell them that you do have an appendix uh, uh, <laughs> suggesting ways people could get involved if they, if they want to get involved. Right. Yeah, so the book is a downer. Don't buy this book to be happy. Uh, it will not do that for you. Um, and because of that, my agent and my publisher and my editor just kept hammering me. And as a fellow journalist, um, it's not a comfortable place to offer advice for journalists. And so I resisted, resisted, resisted. And then I succumbed to offering some sort of counsel on what's to be done. And the appendix is my best effort to answer that. Um, the first thing I usually say is don't try, don't, don't, you know, it's sort of like how do we solve injustice? It's not a question I'll ever answer because it's framed at a ridiculously high altitude level that you can't possibly succeed in answering. Similarly, what's to be done about the outlaw ocean is not a question worth tackling. It's better if you bring that down, choose, and this is what the appendix says, you know, murder of stowaways, murder with impunity, sea slavery, intentional dumping, arms trafficking, um, uh, illegal fishing, overfishing, uh, ocean plastic. I mean, there's a whole huge list of things to be unhappy and worried about in here. Um, I think the smart play is find the thing that most speaks to you and then focus on that. And the appendix attempts to offer counsel for where you can plug in on each issue. So, um, two questions, quick. Um, I was an English major a long time ago, um, and there's a whole tradition of writing about the sea, Herman Melville, Joseph Conrad, um, whoever wrote the poem about the albatross, about how um, life is different at sea. It's, it's sort of its own uh, enclosed, separate microcosm. That was the word they always used in class. Um, Hemingway, the old man in the sea. Mm -hmm. Did you have a sense that you were tapping into some of this or some of it was reflected? And my other question is the law of the sea, does it apply in any, in any way? Mm. So yes, on the first question, mm -hmm. very much so. And to some degree, that was what pulled me in, in the first place. Because even in grad school, when I first was exposed to, we never left port, right? So truth be told, in the three months I was on that vessel, we sat anchored in port because we couldn't get papers to go. Uh, I spent the whole time talking with, this was in Singapore, with right. a bunch of different types of workers who were coming and going. And, and that's when you know the anthropologist running away from his dissertation backed into a new dissertation topic, um, which was, wow, these folks are really interesting and they have their own code of ethics and their own hierarchy and their own language and their own exactly. diversity of crime. And, you know, and, um, 
they are really a tribe that is largely invisible. It's huge and transient and essential, et cetera. So yes, um, even on onshore exposure, I noticed that. And then once I was on vessels and it all comes into play, the hierarchies and the modes of interaction and such, um, I realized even the laws of physics are different out there. You know, mm -hmm. your relationship with time, different out there. And so it is truly, I've said before, um, this experience for me at least, reporting the book and being out there, was sort of like space travel on Earth or time travel. Space mm -hmm. travel on Earth for the reasons you already alluded to. Um, time travel in the sense that I was encountering things that I thought were gone, you know, bygone. Um, slavery, privateering, you know, private maritime security guards, um, uh, illegal whaling. Um, piracy. Piracy, right? You know, and, and yeah, it looked a little bit different than what I read about, but not that different. Um, so for those reasons, I really felt like it was a divorced world, and that's why I became addicted. Um, your second question. And the law of the sea? Law of the sea. Um, Unclaw. So amazing document, kind of constitution for the sea. Um, my impression, and I see some people here that know a lot about the law of the sea, um, uh, is it's fatal flaw is it was written by diplomats, not labor lawyers or human rights lawyers or um, even seafarers. Mm -hmm. um, so as a document that is protective, it's great, um, but it was written in a way that doesn't take into account the realities of nation states and such. And any law is going to be hugely flawed if there's no enforcement mechanism. And the law of the sea just – so there are major problems in national waters up to the 12 or the 200 right. line mark. But they become you know, colossal when you're on the high seas because there's no one out there that really has the boats and the guns and the authority to do something about it. And that's why you have these fascinating vigilante type characters who step up and do things um, – uh, for better, for, for worse. Thank you. It sounds like it's going to be a great book. <laughs> Hi, my name is Robert Dubeck. I'm uh, interested in your description of the um, sailing population as a tribe. Mm -hmm. So I guess the question is, why do they remain in the tribe? I mean, what's the percentage of uh, depletion? Uh, for example, you talk about slavery. Is there no chance to escape? And for the guys standing silently on the bridge, mm. do they really want to live like that? Mm. It's a really good question. Um, so I think it's best answered to some degree in different demographic silos. So sailors are one thing, right? Folks who are on sailing. And, and I don't touch those folks at all. Um, Merchant mariners uh, who are moving cargo are, in some ways, their own demographic, and it's highly unionized. Um, the experience on those ships is very different. There are challenges and abuses, but not of the type and order that you find in the fishing fleet. It's 1.6 million, roughly, men mostly, but more and more women are entering that field. It's highly automated. It's large companies. They're contracts. Okay, now 56 million on fishing boats. Only a small portion of those are long haul. Okay, so why do folks do these things? Let's go straight to the long haul fishing because that's where the that's the front edge of the sword. Um, most of the folks who work those jobs are desperately poor, and um, this is a rare chance to access a wage that they could never access in their home country. Um, uh, it is a, an opportunity to see things that uh, they never would imagine seeing in their village or city. Um, it's got a long established sort of swashbuckling history to it, you know, a macho vibe that comes with it. So it's attractive to young men for those reasons too. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I say men intentionally because in fishing it's – uh, especially in this long haul fishing, there are no women. Um, 
And then I think they stay, and, and I'm not touching the trafficked migrant workers who get trapped. I'll get to that. But uh, those who decidedly say, stay, um, I'm, my best guess is they um, don't know anything else. And there's this strange addiction to it. Um, this gets me back to this stupidly high altitude point I was trying to make about what it does to your brain. You know, the, the, the sort of gruff captain, you know, it's a real thing. And I was sort of wondering sort of why it's a real thing. And, and that's when I start wondering about what this does to your psychology. And um, I, I think the closest comparison is to troops who go, it's, it's sort of a mix between PTSD and troops who are, abroad, who are in war zones or away from home for too long and solitary confinement. Put those things together and you have consequences on your very wiring, your relationship with space, your relationship to people, how you interact and communicate, your sense of hierarchies or lack thereof, all these things. So when you spend a lot of time out there, like these guys do, some of them are doing two-year tours on fishing ships. When you get back home, you're really ill-equipped. Um, and so you feel deeply uncomfortable. Even in your very um, biology, you know, I have a weird ear, so I never got seasick. But I got horribly landsick. So whenever I – and people, doctors, what I read was that if you're – prone to not getting seasick, you're probably extra susceptible to land sickness, which is essentially your pendulum won't reacclimate. So you get back to land and you have bed spins, even though you're standing and you throw up. And so my point being, it affects you deeply. And I was doing short stints, you know, two, uh, two months or a month at most, these guys are. So for all of those reasons, from the wage to the psych psychology, to the solidarity of the relationships you build, um, I think people go into it and often don't come out. Um, now, sea slaves, different story altogether. Uh, I tried to tap into a little bit of that in that first intro. If you imagine yourself, um, you're a Cambodian guy from an inland village, uh, you're desperately poor, you meet someone at a festival. This is the story of Lang Long, a guy who was shackled by the neck. Um, and this is sort of a textbook story. Uh, over and over again. Hey, I can get you a job in Thailand uh, in construction, usually is the pitch. You can earn this much. You know, you certainly can't do this here with your rice patty. Um, I don't have a cent to my name. Don't worry about it. Meet me on Sunday at this place. Get in the back of the pickup truck. I'll deal with the debt. We'll figure it out later. Off you go. Along the way, you're picking up more people. Border guard, you get across the border. You're in Thailand. A couple days, weeks later, now you're probably a dozen in this truck. You're along the way being held in, above karaoke bars in these, which are brothels, in these uh, kind of bunk rooms. And then you realize, well, first of all, you don't speak Thai, right? Uh, most of the other guys are equally clueless, equally broke. Um, now you realize you're not headed to a construction job. You're headed to the port. You get to the port. Along the way, things get a little bit scarier. Suddenly, you're not allowed to leave the room. It's locked. Suddenly, there are guys with guns who you see rough people up if they mouth off or whatever. And you're realizing, OK, this is pretty serious. Um, now you're at the port. Now it's deadly serious. Guys with guns at night, shoved around. This guy shows up. He's all beaten up. You realize they march you onto the boat. Money exchanges hand. What's happening there is me, you, the trafficker, and me, the captain, I've just bought, I've just paid you for these guys for the cost of their transport. And now I own these guys. And when you leave port, you know, there's no bookkeeping. Today you, earned, you did well, you earned. So that is the kind of textbook version of entrapment. Um, and that is, again, not just South China Sea, Thailand, that is off coasts of New Zealand, off the coast of Falkland Islands off the coast of Hawaii, you know, that is the migrant deckhand story. And that's a whole different order. And if you don't know how to swim and there's only one guy who, you, the bosun is usually the intermediary between the officers, five officers, say five Thai officers, a bosun, and then maybe 40 Cambodian crew. And the bosun is the scariest person on the boat because he is probably Cambodian but speaks Thai and he's kind of one of the, 
and uh, he imposes discipline, does the beatings, disappears people when necessary, and um, you know. So, and if you try to escape, do you know how to swim? Where are you escaping to? Borneo, Indonesia. Um, so it's um, it's it's a pretty dire entrapment, and surprisingly common. Sorry for such a long answer. But yeah. no chance of escape. They don't ever hit port. Sure, they do. There's a great movie out now called Ghost Fleet, which talks a little bit about that in the floor story. Um, there, and in the book, there's um, a section of a chapter in the sea slavery chapter about this really inspiring underground railroad that exists right. uh, of advocates who specialize in trying to help these folks. And usually what that looks like is they sneak off. If the boat comes, there's a lot of transshipment, so these boats are often meeting another boat out at sea. Sometimes they try to sneak off and get on the, the mothership. Um, sometimes they come to port, they're watched, but if they can sneak off and hide out, and if they are lucky enough to have a phone that works in whatever country they're in, et cetera, et cetera, then they call one of these advocates who then tries to help them get away from the port. And fi uh, final word is that I am uh, astounded by your courage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. That's okay. You've been describing um, criminal activity and human trafficking that leads to, you know, a space where there are few laws. Mm. And some of this activity also exists on land where there is laws. Can you describe other activity that you saw on the ships that was criminal and outside the law that perhaps surprised you or you didn't think would exist mm. and that is then also beyond the law? All right, so I'm going to buy time as I try to look for an answer to make sure, but first make sure I understand the question. So other types of illegality on the ships um, that were surprising. Right. Mm. But not necessarily human rights, labor, environmental? Or are you personally more it could interested? Be, it could be anything from anything that either surprised you or you saw people involved maybe in drug trafficking mm. and forced to do a secondary crime mm. uh, or whatever you were experiencing when you were okay, there. Okay, that helped. Um, a lot of it surprised me. So just to start with the surprise, um, I was surprised by the impunity in general and the severity of violence and how um, one story that was in the paper originally but expanded in the book, um, a murder caught, you know, filmed on a cell phone camera by one of the deckhands. The guys posed for selfies at the end. The footage gets on the internet. We spent at the Times a year trying to blow the story up and really embarrass relevant players, Taiwan, Singapore, et cetera, Interpol, to do something about it. Really didn't get very far. Um, so just egregious, well-documented, dozen witnesses murder, um, that captain is still out at sea. And his name, much thanks to a Nat Geo, uh, reporter, investigator who picked up after we broke the story and did incredible work, um, that captain's name is known. Um, so impunity in general with violence and worse um, surprised me. Um, interesting and complicated interplay between environmental and human rights concerns, if not crimes. So two examples come to mind. One is shark finning. So shark fin soup. Um, the cartilage in fins is a textured thing, somewhat tasteless, but has been very popular in Asian countries, has driven a market for the fins of sharks and a massive depletion of shark population to sell these fins. Um, the, the interesting in, um, economic relationship between the underpayment of deckhands um, and the illegality of shark finning looks like a crew of 12 Indonesians are brought on board. They're paid ridiculously low wages, but they're told they can keep the shark fins wage. So when they pull up, they're aiming at tuna or whatever. Um, but they do things to the line to heighten the chances that they'll also get sharks. Because when they do, they cut the fin, throw the shark, because the meat of the shark itself is not really. The ship captains say, you guys can, when you get to port, split the wages of the shark fins, and on the black market, sell those. And that'll supplement your subpar wage. And this is in contracts I've read. 
you know, so the black market and the illegal behavior and the, you know, horrific um, environmental um, behavior of shark finning as it relates to the deep problem of wage theft. Um, one example um, that kind of shocked me and was explained to me early on and then I saw it firsthand, you know, how these guys were like, yeah, it's really rough on the ship and we're paid ridiculous wage, but we make good money on the shark fins. Um, and it incentivizes them to really like do their job because they're looking for sharks. The tuna, yeah, whatever. We don't make money on that. But um, the, the meta uh, relationship between our depletion of the oceans and fish stocks and especially the overfishing of near shore stocks causing these boats to have to go much further from land to break even, the, the profit margin shrink even more and incentivizing dark ways to make that work, like more dependence on sea slaves. That sort of environmental problem driving a human rights problem, also surprising and interesting to me. This is my grad school kind of, you know, th these are all conceptual things. There are lots of things I saw that were viscerally interesting, um, but these are, <clears throat> and then the last example I'll give you of these interesting hand and glove relations was, um, and I, it's all in the book, um, so our Cambodian story, you know, um, along the way when the Cambodian guy is being brought not to his construction job but to the port and they're being kept usually in karaoke bars, which are brothels, there's often this really interesting dark entrapment system where uh, maybe these are Loatians or maybe these are Burmese or maybe these are Cambodians, but these are the other funnel of trafficked labor that are largely coming in. The females, mostly girls, not even women, are split at the border. And literally, we saw in Ranong that happen. Like people were being split into different trucks. And the females are supposedly um, being trapped or being labor brokered into the, oh, I always forget the term, the um, domestic. So the job offer there at the festival back in Cambodia was would you like to work as a domestic, meaning a live in maid? Um, they're not destined for domestic jobs. They're destined for the sex industry. And, and so the females are getting put in that funnel, right? And a lot of them end up in the brothels that these guys are. So when the guys are on their way in and they're being housed upstairs, they sometimes carouse downstairs with fellow Cambodian females or Loatian or Burmese. And the females are supposed to really work these guys, right? So they run up a tap. The guys, again, don't have a cent to their name. But they're assuming they're naive or whatever, that this is kind of part of the road trip in and they don't need to worry about it. They wake up the next morning and they realize that all that they partook in the night before is now added to their debt that will then be handed over to the captain. I, that was just, and we went to, I heard about this on vessels and then finally we, a photographer and I went to Ranong to really just look at this and spent time at karaoke bars and it's a real thing and it's, it's just unbelievable the depravity um, and you have essentially children, migrant, trafficked workers of one category being used to entrap the same demographic of a different gender of another in the same institutions by these sort of, and the karaoke bar owners are often the same person or really close with the labor brokers, cousin or whatever, and there's this whole grid of sometimes when the guys come off the ships, they say, okay, your debt's cleared, you have this much wage, we're not giving you the money, we're giving you credit at the karaoke bar. So they don't have any real method to escape or to get a bus or whatever, they don't have their passport and they don't have a cent, but they've got credit at the karaoke bar. So they go drink and carouse, et cetera, and then they're back on the ship. So these are some of the crimes that entered. Well, I hope this will lighten things up a little bit. Good luck with that, yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering about the diet of the tribe. How much is seafood? How much is land food? Um, it's all seafood uh, on the ships mostly, usually pulled out of the water there. A lot of boiled squid um, and rice. Not, you don't see much vegetables. Dried meat sometimes is brought on the wealthier, you know, on the ships with more resources. Um, this varies. I mean, I was on... Uh, 
police vessels, medical vessel, and those are a whole different order. Right. Those are, you know, some of the best Frozen vegan food I had was on, you know, <laughs> Sea Shepherd ships and everyone's vegan or vegetarian. So it really varies. But on the, the you know, the real fishing ships, it's all, it's not great cuisine. Thanks. Mm. I didn't see, I didn't get it, but I didn't see much, uh, you know, the pills and, um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, Ian, uh, first of all, thank you so much for, for coming out today and congratulations on the book launch. Uh, I, I guess, not to add to the pile, but I had sort of two questions. One, did you feel like there was a considerable impact or response to your original series of articles? Mm -hmm. uh, and two, I was struck by your answer to, or there, your comments on UNCLOS earlier. Uh, right now, the UN is, of course, debating the Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction mm -hmm. Treaty. So what advice if any, and what outreach have you been able to do to prevent that from turning into uh, unclose part two? Mm. So let me go backwards. What was the first one, by the way? Uh, the resonation to your original oh, yeah. response. Yeah, for, for that reason too. Okay, so uh, um, the thing you're referencing for the rest of the crowd is this really important measure um, that I think in many ways um, uh, is attempting to fix some of the things that um, I learned from some people in this room were flawed in the way that governance exists at sea. Uh, among those things it's hope, hoping to fix is the siloed nature with which the rules exist on the high seas. So um, if, you have, if you have a patch of water on the high seas uh, um, and there's one agency that is supposed to oversee uh, seabed mining and drill, you know, the seafloor, and another agency that's supposed to be the one that's checking on whether it's okay to lay internet lines, and then another one that's supposed to watch over tuna, not all fish, but you know, you've got all these different things that are, and there's a general lack of a comprehensive sense of the impacts and traffic and industrial uses collectively in that space. That's a big problem. And as I understand it, the treaty is supposed to address that. Um, then also, there is a movement afoot um, that is similar to, and I think based on your question, you know this already, so this is for everyone else, but um, to create more off-limits spaces, MPAs, marine protected areas at sea that are really supposed to be apart from all industrial activity. Um, and there's a push to increase the percentage globally of space on the water that is designated as such. Um, the challenge, of course, is who has the right to do that? What country uh, and what mechanism exists to create an MPA over this area? Um, that's not entirely clear, and that's another key thing that I think the Biodiversity Treaty will hope to fix. Advice from me, I'm not in the advice visit, partially because literally there are people in the room that know a whole lot more and I'm not going to step into it. Um, uh, I'm just rendering what I've heard. I think on the simplest level, I would say enforcement, enforcement, enforcement um, uh, is going to be the key. So um, now, impact of the series. You know, I, I don't, you know, I saw a little... Um, patches of consequences come out of that story. Um, other journalists do great work and pick up and do things I couldn't accomplish, like that murder video. Um, uh, individual impacts, like the story of Lang Long, the man who was shackled by the neck, um, that story, for whatever reason, really captivated um, Secretary of State Kerry and others. USAID um, uh, uh, and others uh, really sort of seized on that story and exerted themselves and at least on the on the individual and the Thai government um, on Lang and I followed Lang Long through the book for the next three years and went to visit him etc and um, his life was radically altered for the better he's still a broken human being but uh, after being you know on these ships for three years and shackled um, but so there were concrete things I do think. There's also, and not credit to my series, I, I played a part, but AP and 
U.S. State Department and USAID and lots of other players, um, there was a crescendo in the last five years of attention on um, much like blood diamonds or sweatshop, you know, garments or um, dolphin-free tuna. There have been supply chain individual um, commodities that have their moment when a lot of Western institutions realize we got big problems, labor, human rights problems in that supply chain. We got to do something about it. And I think that the seafood industry is having one of those moments now. And we all played a part in throwing light on that. So those are the big and small impacts I think we've had. Thank you. So let's see. Are there any more questions over here? One. Oh, there's like four there. Okay. Five or six minutes. Okay, so I'll be super fast. Uh, hi, I used to be a fisheries observer domestically in Longline uh, and Gilnet fishing fleets. And I had American captains who wanted to kill me. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you go abroad and convince these people to take you on? And what, if any, safety net did you have? <laughs> uh, uh, so I'll go with the easy first. Uh, safety net. Um, uh, I had a Garmin, you know, a... Uh, uh, and I had a whole network of people that kind of were looking out for me. And truth be told, jokes aside, I had a U.S. passport. I had, you know, um, uh, and all the things that come with that. You know, like the I, I'm uh, the deckhands and the and even the in-country photographer, in-country translator. Those folks who have to stay there. Those folks um, are ten times more at risk than I am because I come in and I go out and. The headache you would get by doing harm to me is so much worse than to them or even to you as when you were doing that work. Um, a foreign journalist comes in um, and then the, they're not probably going to do anything to you. Um, the further out, like on this, when you got really far out on the sea slavery vessels, um, they don't speak English. They never had the New York Times. They couldn't care. But you ask permission to get on, and if they let you on, then as long as you don't break certain rules, you're probably going to be okay. Um, again, the worrisome thing is what will happen to someone they, the bosun sees you talking to after. They're not even probably going to read the story uh, later. So, um, And then how the first question, um, it, it took a lot of time to get to convince people and a lot of tries usually. Um, so for example, on the sea slavery story, the hopscotching, the first jump in that hopscotch was always the hardest, the first 40, because those guys are coming back to port. They know that Thailand has just been bumped into category three and they're aware that it's a bad idea to bring a journalist with you or be seen doing that. We, you pay in, in, at the Times and for the publications I write for, you can never pay a source, but you can pay for transport. So I can't quote that first guy, but I can learn from him and he can take me out to the second guy, et cetera. And they're looking to make money. So, um, but you go out with these guys who spent five weeks going to bars and growing it up and drinking with these guys and kind of like showing them who we are, photographer and I, and also really candidly telling them our perspective. And the more, the more honest you are with them and time, the more they, I found they tended to be open to taking you. Oh, we lost her. Okay. Okay, great. I was wondering, it sounds like a pretty dismal life for these enslaved, <laughs> for them, yeah. um, you know, indentured. Are there moments of joy? Are there moments of humor? Are there moments of fellowship? Is there something that happens on that boat that makes it worth getting up the next morning and doing it all again? And mm -hmm. second, what happens when you're injured or mm -hmm. you um, uh, age out? Mm -hmm. What happens to those people? So great questions, both of them. Um, yeah, and I think that's one shortcoming of the book, one of many. Um, uh, there's a lot of joy and there's a lot of inspiring kind of um, uh, ingenuity and playfulness and humor and sort of will to survive and, and then some. Um, 
even in the very sort of songs that they use to keep everyone in synchronicity, um, in the sort of braggadocia, the very macho braggadocia on who got hit harder by that spinning thing. And, you know, there's, people are playful creatures and um, you see that here. Uh, and many of the categories we talk about, you know, trafficking and debt bonded, and, you know, it's just a job, you know, and um, relationships and yeah, there's the boast and there's some bad stuff that goes down, but there's also friendships. And so, um, yes, is the simple answer. Uh, and there's heroism, you know, all around in terms of the people that are working to, um, better the lives of, so uh, what was the second question? What happens if you age out age or out. you get yeah. injured? So the injury, injury one is, so the, the biggest threat, uh, on these ships on, the worst of the worst are um, is infection. Uh, the hygienic situation is just unbelievable, um, and you're, they're always wet, and they're always got cuts, and and uh, there are just obscene amounts of amphetamines and no medicine, no anything. Um, you just kind of salt water it, you know, and um, and then people get seasick. These are mostly folks who have never been on the water, and they go, and there's no you know patch, you know, for sea. There's, <laughs> You're up at you know four a.m. and expect to be working. And if you're throwing up, fine. Just don't hit the fish. But you better not stop. And and they really don't cut any slack. And if you're then if you get sick, really sick, you know, um, that's a very dangerous situation to be in for the deckhand. Um, and that's those that's shocking statistic I cited of forty nine percent, fifty percent had seen murder when you drill into what does that murder look like? It's sometimes machete or, but it's usually he was sick and for a week straight he was on his back and then he wasn't there the next morning. And, and I saw, someone saw in the middle of the night, he was not dead, but, but they're not going back to shore. So age out, I didn't see that issue much. There were some older guys who usually had risen up to the rank of bosun, but, um, it's a pretty young man's game. We get through it. I might be the last. Hi, Ian. Hey, it's how are really you? great to see your nice, book. Nice to see um, you. Thank you for this. Um, and you do the Shine a Global Spotlight mm -hmm. on the sort of intersecting challenges, the governance gaps mm -hmm. between labor, uh, human rights, fishing, um, complex challenges, complex solutions will be required, changes in law, mm -hmm. changes in policy, national level, international level. Mm -hmm. I know that's not your mm -hmm. area where you're mm -hmm. going to go into, you know, prescribing these solutions, but your appendix, I think, is really going to inform mm -hmm. policymakers mm -hmm. and shining your spotlight on this. We, there's no going away. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that contribution. Sure. Um, it will have, a, I think, a global impact. Um, what are you going to focus on next? I mm -hmm. hear that you're going mm -hmm. back or your plans are to go back to sea. And what do you hope to focus on? I I promise you I didn't plant her. It was like, her, it was like right on script. Um, Thank you. Uh, so I have been, at, ha, have been at the Times for about 16, 17 years on staff. And several months ago, I stepped back to be a contract writer for them um, so that I could start producing content for other venues. And also so I could stick with this. Just uh, so um, I'm going to continue doing these sorts of stories. Um, uh, there were a, because I became like one of those guys I was describing in the early question, somewhat hooked on the place and the people and B because there were so many stories I didn't get to that were just epic. Um, mm -hmm. and there's such a dearth of journalism coming out of that space. There's good journalism. That's like academic journalism, but sort of investigative narrative, long form journalism, uh, is not a whole lot consistently coming out. So for all those reasons, I want to keep working on this. So my plan is for the next, you know, five years um, to, to keep producing stories in some form or another uh, along these lines. I look forward to reading them. Well, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.